Good morning. My name is Linda Legg, and here we are on class five of our overview of the end times. What does the Bible say about these things? And um, before we get started, I'd like to have a word of prayer. So would you join your heart with mine, please? Father God, we just thank you for this morning. We ask, Lord God, your presence here in the class. We ask the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord, with anyone who watches this online. And we ask, O oh God, that you would just uh, open our eyes to see and our hearts to receive, Lord, what you have for us from your word. And I ask that you cause me to be especially sensitive, to Lord, to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that he is truly the teacher here. And I praise you and thank you, giving you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're into an overview. It's a very brief overview of the end times and what that entails. Uh, in class one, we learned, uh, we talked about are we now living in the end times and what's exactly meant by the end times. Some people think the end times means any time after the ascension of Christ because that's when it began. But there's a specific period of time that are, is labeled the end times, the last seven years before the end of the earth and the second coming of Christ. So why should we believe what the Bible teaches? We talked about that, the events to come. God wants us to know. That's why he put it in there. Uh, what's the next important event that must happen before the end of all times? And when will Jesus return? Um, what's the difference between the rapture and the second coming? I covered all those things. In class three, we talked about the tribulation period, which is what many scholars refer to as the end times, because it's the last seven years. Um, the purpose of the tribulation period, and are we now in the tribulation period, and how do we know? We talked about all those things in class three. Also, why is the seven-year time period divided into two halves, the lesser tribulation, the greater tribulation? We got into that in class three. Last week in class four, we talked about the mark of the beast, and can we take it unknowingly? And who is the Antichrist? What do the scriptures tell us about this coming world leader who's going to lead the whole world in, in, in the global government at the time of the end or during those last seven years? And his cohort, the false prophet, who is he? And what event, events distinguish this period of time? There are going to be ca catastrophic events on the planet Earth, according to the Bible, during this period of time. Class 5, this is the class we're going to take a look at today, and we're going to talk about will we face the judgment of God? What's the difference between the two resurrections? The scripture speaks of two separate resurrections, and we're going to take a look at a timeline, uh, when do those occur, and who's being resurrected at those times. And are we going to face the judgment of God? We're going to discuss that this morning. And then next week, we're going to talk about the difference between the millennial reign of Christ on the earth and the new heavens and the new earth. This is all an overview of what we are told in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 about the, this earth being destroyed and a new earth being created. And also about his millennial reign. And what will the conditions on the earth be like during the millennial reign of Christ? We're going to talk about that next week, and also about the, the eternal city that's going to um, be built. Anyway, we're on class five. Today we're going to talk about the judgment of God. Well, what does that mean, and when will we face it, and what's the difference between the two resurrections? So that's the focus for today. Remember, all these classes are an overview. I'm assuming that you have had some of these things before because I'm giving you a lot of meat. And uh, anyway, it's, it's an overview. And what will our resurrected bodies be like? What will our eternal bodies be like? We're going to talk about that in detail today. Okay, so when we face the judgment of God, what does the Bible say? Aren't Christians exempt from judgment? You know, through the blood of Christ and the blood covenant, aren't we exempt from the judgment of God? Well, let's take a look at this. 
There's a thing called the Bema Judgment Seat of Christ, and it's based on this scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him. For the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So this scripture tells us that we all will stand before this judgment seat of Christ. Scholars refer to this as the Bema judgment, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But notice that we're going to receive what is due us. This is mostly a judgment not for punishment, but for rewards. And we'll, we'll show you this. So what is the Bema judgment? Why is it called the judgment seat? Or the Bema seat? It's called the Bema seat or judges stand, which was an elevated seat on which the umpire sat during the Greek games. That's where the word Bema came from. And where the winners received their crowns of laurel wreaths after the races, after the events. They all received their awards. It's like the podium at the Olympics where this, the, you know, the, the, Olymp the um, athletes stand on the podiums and receive their awards and so on. But this is the Bema judgment where Jesus himself will stand to give you the rewards that you've earned for what you've done in this life. Now, there are seven judgments that are prophesied in the scripture. Um, I've written a book on that topic. It's called The Seven Judgments of God, and it's available on Amazon. But I'm only going to talk about one today. All right? The subject, there's, uh, these seven judgments have different subjects, and that's why they're different judgments. First of all, we have the judgment of the believers, and there are two judgments referring to believers. Then we have the judgment of non-believers, that's at the great white throne judgment. We will have the nation of Israel judged at the second coming of Christ, and also the Gentile nations will be judged at that time. Then we have this judging of Satan, and also the judgment of the angels. So these are the subjects of the seven judgments. But let's focus on uh, us, the believers. What judgments are we going to be subject to? Two of these judgments pertain to the believers. The Bema judgment of Christ is one, and the other one is self-judgment, which is going on even now. Okay, what does that mean? This is judgment number one, self-judgment. This is based on scripture in 1 Corinthians 11.31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay, what does that mean? That means if I do something wrong and I realize and judge myself that, hey, this was wrong, you shouldn't have done that, then I go to the Lord and ask forgiveness, then it's not going to be judged. It's gone. God has forgiven me if I'm sincere in asking for his forgiveness. It go the scripture goes on, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Yes, he chastens us through the presence of his Holy Spirit, the conviction of our consciences, that we should not be condemned with the world. So when I ask forgiveness for something, he forgives me, and it is gone. I no longer have to be judged for it. I have judged myself, and I've asked forgiveness. Okay, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so if, if I've done something, I ask forgiveness, it's gone. He, he, he forgives us and cleanses us. It's, it, he, he doesn't even remember it anymore. Now, Satan will try to bring this stuff back to you to condemn you, to separate you from Christ. He will try to damage your relationship with Jesus Christ by convincing you, oh, look at what you did here and there in your life. And he will bring these things to condemn you. But don't allow that. Say, no, Satan, you can't tell, tell me that I'm being condemned. I have no r reason to think less of myself. I ask forgiveness for that. It's gone. God has forgiven me. Now, the second judgment that believers, you and I, will face is the judgment seat of Christ, which is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Here it is again, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him. Now, that means that we're going to receive 
rewards. You see? That's what this judgment is all about. What is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In Romans 14.10, we see this scripture. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Now this is a reference to the judgment seat of Christ to which the believers must stand. Now the place of this is going to be in heaven. This is a summary of this judgment. Where does it occur? It occurs in heaven after the rapture, before the marriage supper, but after the rapture. The marriage supper of the Lamb occurs before the second coming. So this judgment occurs in heaven before the marriage supper. The judge, of course, is Jesus Christ, because it's called his judgment seat. The subject are the believers. And the tests are the works are tested by fire. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're going to look at that in just a minute. And the consequence, of course, is the awarding of crowns. Did you know that crowns are awarded to believers for what they have done during their lifetimes? There are five different crowns that are mentioned in Scripture. I'm going to get to that in just a second, too. So what's the criteria for this judgment? Let's talk about that. Jesus will be my judge, or our judge. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. This is one of the appointed times of the Lord. You know, I've shown you before that uh, timeline, that God's timeline of the events that are going to happen in the order in which we believe they're going to happen based on their sequence in the scriptures. And this is one of them, okay? But th it is one of the appointed times. Judge nothing before the time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, when it says, until the Lord comes, this is a reference again to the rapture. When the Lord comes for his bride and takes us to heaven, then we will be judged and we will be rewarded. And he will judge us, look at this, according to to the motives of our hearts. So, I've used this example many times. If I donate money to the church and ask that a wing be built on the church and then ask that my name be put on that wing, I have my reward. Because my motive there is not to, to uh, help the kingdom of God or to assist the church. My motive is to glorify myself, you see? So God will look at the motives of your heart when you have done things in, during your life, and then he will reward you accordingly. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. All the things that we do must be based on our faith in Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring to it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And that fire is the introspection of the Lord Jesus into your heart. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. Now notice that our salvation is not in question here. No matter what you've done in your life, as long as you have accepted Christ as your Savior, and he has, you've been born again, you know, that your spirit has been changed, you're saved. No matter what you do afterward. Okay? But look at this. The builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved. And this is a promise that this is not for our salvation, whether or not we get to go to be with the Lord in heaven, but rather it's for rewards or crowns, which you'll see in just a second. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. 
So the consequences of this judgment. This is a chart from Clarence Larkin, one of my favorite guys, favorite scholars. He, this is way back in the beginning of the, the, the 20th century, actually 1917, in his book called The, the um, Dispensations of God. And um, this is a chart that's available online for free if you uh, download Clarence Larkin's stuff for free. Okay, and this shows the five crowns that are going to be given. It has this, the scriptural references to them, and this is a handout on your. This is a slide on the handout that I, that you can receive for this class. It's a full page slide that you can print out if you just designate the, the slide number and hit print slide. But let's take a look at these five crowns that are mentioned. Okay, there are five crowns mentioned in the New Testament. The crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of glory, the crown of life, and the incorruptible crown. So let's look at some of the scriptures that refer to these. The crowns that are given are 2 Timothy 4, 7 to 8, the crown of righteousness. Now these are references to these different crowns. 1 Thessalonians uh, 219 in Philippians 4 1 the crown of rejoicing this is on your handout so that you can look these up I'm not going to take the time to dig into each one because it would take too long in first Peter 5 4 the crown of glory which is the elders crown those who serve as elders in the church or leaders in the church and in James 1 12 we have the crown of life which is referred to also in Revelation 2.10, and then the incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians 9.25. So there are five crowns that are mentioned that are going to be given to Christians, to believers, according to what they've done in their lifetimes. So when will this judgment happen? This is based on the sequence of events in the Revelation, okay? The letters to the seven churches are the first three chapters, that tells us that, that the, those letters are addressed to the church on the earth. After chapter 3, the church is not mentioned any longer. Because at the beginning of chapter 4, John is caught up to heaven. And many look at that as symbolizing the time when the church will be taken up to heaven. Chapters 4 and 5 talk about what John sees when he gets there. Then, of course, chapters 6 through 18, the majority of the book of Revelation deals with the events on the earth during the time of the seven-year period of tribu tribulation. That horrible time when, when the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the unbelievers on the earth. Now, will there be believers on the earth at the time? Yes. 144,000 witnesses are going to be sent out, according to the scriptures. These are Jewish witnesses, but they go out to witness of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And many people will be saved during that period of time. And some will survive the tribulation period to enter into the millennium. And I'll get into the groups of people who are going to be here on the earth during the millennial reign next week or next class. The marriage supper of the Lamb then is described. So we know that that happens after the tribulation period but before the second coming. Immediately after the marriage supper is described in chapter 19, we have the scriptures that describe the second coming of Christ. And at the second coming, he actually touches down, and he's going to do that on Mount Olivet, the same place where the Shekinah glory cloud left, where Jesus left, and where, Je and where Jesus will return, the Mount of Olives, or Mount Olivet, just east of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, when will this judgment occur? There is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day. Again, a reference to the coming of the Lord for his church, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. In Revelation twenty-two twelve, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. So, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Again, this is a reference to the time of the Bema judgment seat of Christ, not the other judgments. So when will this occur? 
in Luke 14, 13, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, now this is an important phrase here, the resurrection of the righteous, because there are two different resurrections that are talked about in the scripture. This is one of them. The resurrection of the righteous, the other one is the resurrection of those who are not righteous. So the beam and judgment seat, it happens at the resurrection of the righteous, which is when the, the um, rapture occurs, people are raised from the dead, and it happens in heaven. Now this is God's appointed timeline. I've shown you this many times before, but this is a timeline. Right now we're in the church age. Okay, the next event, according to my beliefs, is the rapture of the church, when the church is going to be taken off this planet and taken to heaven. Then we're going to have seven years of tribulation. That's the last seven years of the planet Earth. Okay? Then the, after the seven years of the tribulation, we have the second coming and the millennial reign of Christ. There will be great changes on the Earth before the second coming. Now, when I said that the seven-year tribulation is the last years of the earth. Technically, the earth continues for another thousand years after that in the millennial reign, but it's going to be a very different place. I'm going to talk about the conditions that scripture teaches us about the millennial reign next week. But here we have the second coming, of course, then the battle of Armageddon, where the armies of the Antichrist are defeated, all right? And... Um, the nations are judged, Israel is judged, and then we have the millennial reign. Now, this extends for a thousand years past the second coming. Jesus has promised that he's going to set up his, his kingdom on the earth again, okay? Uh, we're told there are eight times as many prophecies of his second coming and his millennial reign as there are of his first coming, and all the Christian churches, no matter whether they're Baptist or Episcopalian, whatever, doesn't make any difference. They all agree that Jesus is going to return. They all agree on that. And, of course, at the end of the millennium, then we have the great white throne judgment. And then we have the earth destroyed. This thing that we're standing on is going to be destroyed by fire. And a new heaven and a new earth are going to be and made in its place. And we will be living there in the new city, which I'll get to next week. Okay, the beam of judgment then occurs after the rapture, but before the second coming. And it happens in heaven. Scripture speaks of two resurrections. Now let's get into the difference between the two resurrections. What's the difference between these two, and when do they occur? Now, this is based on Daniel 12, 1, Revelation 20, 4 through 6. Okay, and we're going to look at those scriptures. Now, this is the angel Gabriel's words to Daniel. This is really important. You know, the angel Gabriel himself, the same angel, the messenger angel that was sent to Mary to give the annunciation of the birth of Christ, the very same angel appeared to Daniel in chapter 9 of Daniel the book of Daniel, and he gave him a prophecy that extends from, that, from the time of the decree to rebuild uh, the city until the second coming. It covers that much time. And anyway, but these are very important words if Gabriel spoke them to Daniel. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Notice that Michael's making a distinction here between the people who are Gentiles and Daniel's people. Extremely important to see that. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, whose people? Daniel's. Who are they? The Jews. Israel. But your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. That's the purpose for those 144,000 Jewish witnesses during the time of the tribulation. They are going to witness to the nation of Israel. And many people are going to turn to, to accept Jesus as their Messiah at that time. 
there's a great multitude who are saved out of that. We see that in Revelation chapter 20. We're going to read that in a minute. Daniel 12, 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth, those are obviously people who are dead, will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Now this makes a distinction between two groups. And that explains how there are two resurrections. The resurrection of the righteous, the ones who have accepted Christ, and then the resurrection of those who have rejected him. So the two resurrections of the saved and of the unsaved, of the righteous and of the unrighteous. So let's take a look at these two resurrections and discuss them. Who's being resurrected? When does it happen? So on. The resurrection of the saved actually happens in three phases. Three phases. How do you get that? Well, because the scriptures describe people being raised from the dead in three, at three different times. I'll show you those scriptures. The, there are three phases in scripture in, in which the resurrection of the righteous is mentioned. All right? So the resurrection of the saved happens in three different phases. First, at the resurrection of Christ, with the Old Testament's righteous. Um, I firmly believe, and I have a study on this topic on my webpage. If you go there, you can download it. It's when Jesus, during the time of his death, the three days that he was dead, went into hell and preached to the captives there and led them free, you know, and uh, these are the Old Testament saints that explains how Noah and Moses and all those Old Testament guys, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they will all be at the marriage supper of the Lamb because they have, been, they have accepted Christ as Savior. So at the resurrection of Christ with the Old Testament righteous, this is referred to in Matthew 27. We're going to read that in a minute. And then another time when the resurrection of the righteous as occurs is, of course, at the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Okay? And then the third time that, the, uh, that a resurrection of the righteous occurs is after the tribulation, but before the millennial reign, when the tribulation martyrs are raised. And we're going to read that. That's in Revelation 20, 4 through 6. So let's take a look at some of these scriptures. First of all, the one that happened, the, fa the first phase of the resurrection of the righteous that happened at when Christ rose from the dead. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Of course, we know that signifies that now man has access to God and he doesn't have to go through the priesthood any longer. You can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe because of the, of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. At that moment, the curtain of the, tor uh, of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. So this happened after Jesus rose on the third day and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So these couple of things. First of all, these people were recognized by the people they left behind, their loved ones, and they came out of the tombs after Jesus was raised from the dead. See, there was a tremendous upheaval in the world of the spirit realm when Jesus was crucified and raised. And it's reflected by the, the events here we see in nature where the, uh, the sky was darkened and then the, the, uh, there was an earthquake and the rocks split. All those things are indications of events that are happening in the realm of the spirit. And I believe that the t place of the dead actually changed at this point in time. Those who had been Old Testament saints, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those guys were in the bosom of Abraham, according to Luke 16. 
And that changed to paradise. On the cross, Jesus told the guy uh, right beside him, on this day you will be with me in paradise. First time that was ever mentioned in scripture. The word paradise does not occur in the scripture until Jesus uttered it on the cross to this, this uh, uh, sinner. Okay, but here we see that they're going to be raised to life and they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. So that was phase one. Now, phase two, what scripture supports that? At the rapture of the church, of course, with the born again of believers. This is in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4.15, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. How do we know these are believers? Because they're in Christ. And this is the, third, the second phase of the first resurrection, when, when righteous people are again, uh, it's recorded that they're raised from the dead. Okay. Now, so we have three phases of this first resurrection. Phase, now, let's talk about phase three at the second coming. After the tribulation, when the uh, tribulation martyrs are raised, we also see a resurrection of the righteous. These are the, the uh, martyrs that, that died during the time of the tribulation, and they refused the mark of the beast. And therefore, they, they were killed or cap decapitated, and the, then they're raised. All right? So here we are. This is a, the timeline again. If you'll notice, we have the church age, phase one. Phase, this happened, uh, the first phase, of course, was at the resurrection of Christ. Phase two is going to be the rapture of the church. And phase three will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation period when those martyrs will be raised. Okay, so this, all of these together are resurrections of righteous people, therefore they, are, they all belong to the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. This is the resurrection of the tri tribulation martyrs. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads. So this marks them as people who have survived or, or gotten through the tribulation by martyring their lives. They did not take the, the, the a mark of the beast and didn't worship its image. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So these guys are going to be raised. They'll be given their resurrected bodies, which I'm going to talk about later. And they will reign with Christ during the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand year period. So this is the resurrection of the tribulation martyrs. Now, some people take this to mean that's when the church is raised. But that's not so. Notice that these are the people who have been on the earth during the time of the tribulation. And they have taken the mark of the four, uh, have refused the mark of the beast. In Revelation 25, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is a reference to those, the resurrection of the unrighteous that happens at the end of the thousand years. Again, this is, a re this is the first resurrection, referring back to the, the resurrection of the martyrs. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Hallelujah. The second death has no power over them. What's the second death? The second death is eternal separation from God. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. I'm looking forward to that time. You'll be there, I'll be there. You know, we're going to be in our resurrected bodies. We'll be one of three groups on the earth. I'm going to explain that next week. But we'll see. Uh, we're going to be the servants of Christ. We will reign on the earth with him. All right, so here we are. This 
Uh, this is the time of the first resurrection happening in three different phases, the resurrection of the righteous. The first resurrection. Now, just exactly what's being raised when the graves are opened. I mean, those bodies have turned to dust. There's nothing left, you know? So what exactly is being raised? Our spirits pass into heaven at the moment of death, right? So what's the big deal about the graves being opened and our bodies being raised? You know, there's a, to be absent from the Lord, or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? And so what's being raised at the resurrection? I've been asked this question many times. At the rapture, the dead in Christ rise first. But I thought the dead in Christ were already with God. What is being raised? Well, let's take a look at this. For we know, uh, this our earthly tents, okay? For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. But this thing that I'm living in, this body with the aches and pains and all that stuff, this is just a tent. I am eternal, an eternal spirit, so as you are. And our spirits leave our bodies at the moment of death. My body will either be cremated or, or buried, whatever I choose, whatever you choose. But it doesn't make any difference to God. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.4. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life, eternal life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Did you know that when you're born again, something happens in your spirit, and you're given a deposit of the Holy Spirit, and that is your guarantee of what is to come, your eternal life. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. And the implication there is, if we're not in our body any longer, we are with the Lord. Now, what about cremation? What about bodies that have been totally destroyed? 9-11, those bodies were completely obliterated, you know? What about the bodies in the sea where there's a burial at sea and all the crabs and fishes have their dinner? You know, I, that's pretty gruesome to think about, but it's the truth. What about those guys? They don't have a body, right? So what's being raised? What about cremation, drowning at sea, when there's nothing left of the natural body? Will God be able to raise these bodies? Well, let's look at some scriptures. God is able to do anything. He's, he is the God of the impossible. And we look at this and we think that's impossible. But look at this. Revelation twenty thirteen, The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Ah! You mean those guys that were buried at sea and eaten by the... Yeah, this is what it says. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. This is just prior to the great white throne judgment, when the unrighteous are going to be raised. Mark Matthew 3, 9, and do you not think you can, you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father? I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. You see, we underestimate our God. He's able to raise our bodies regardless of what we do with them. Matthew 10, 30. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do you know that God knows the number of hairs on your head? It's incredible. Even your most beloved doesn't know that. All right? And in Isaiah 40, 49, 16, he says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Our names are engraved on the palms of God's hands. That's how precious we are to him. And so he's not going to let anything separate us from him, 
including cremation, destruction of the body, whatever. Okay, and 2 Corinthians 4.14, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. We are changed at the moment of this resurrection to be united with our eternal bodies. It's at that moment that our bodies are going to be changed into our eternal bodies, our glorified bodies, the bodies that we're going to have for eternity. So the second resurrection is the resurrection of the unsaved. All right? It occurs at the great white throne judgment. So let's read some of these scriptures. Then I saw, this is Revelation 20, after the tribulation period, after the millennial reign. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence. It's at that moment that the earth is destroyed and the heavens are destroyed and they are replaced after the great white throne judgment. And there was no place for, for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. God has re a record in heaven of all the things everybody does during this lifetime. And you might think that's incredible. Yes, I think it is. However, remember that God is the God of the impossible. This is a, a artist's illustration of the great white throne judgment where these people who have rejected Christ and are at the resurrection of the unrighteous or the unsaved are going to have their lives reviewed by the Lord Jesus Christ. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If you're thrown into the lake of fire, that's your eternal uh, punishment, and there is no hope of Christ or any kind of salvation. You are forever eternally separated from God. That's why it's called the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You know, there's an old adage, if you're born once, you die twice. You die, your physical body dies, but then you die again uh, here at the, the great white throne judgment. But if you're born twice, you only die once. So, I was born as a child, a baby, and, but then I was born again to Christ. So that was my second birth. I was born again. Now I only have to face one death, and that's the death of this physical body. Okay? So the timing of these two resurrections. We already know that this was the first one right here, the first resurrection. The second resurrection happens just before the great white throne judgment occurs. So the, the second resurrection happens right there at the end of the millennial reign after the earth has been destroyed. Uh, this is Clarence Larkin's handout on the two resurrections. This is a separate full-page slide that you can print from the handout for this class. You just have to designate to your printer which slide you want to print, and it will print this out a full-page uh, sheet so that you can see how Clarence Larkin lays this all out visually. Okay, let's talk about the nature of our resurrected bodies. What are these bodies going to be like? Well, what will our changed bodies be like? Let's, there are several scriptural references to this. Let's take a look at a few of them. Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Notice that our bodies are going to be like his glorious body. 
Okay. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He was the first one raised from the dead to be followed by the rest of us. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But someone will, someone will ask, and here's the question that we're asking, how are the dead raised and what kind of body will they, uh, will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. Perhaps a wheat or something else. You know, if you t take a look at a wheat seed, it doesn't look anything like a full-grown wheat plant. But you plant that, and it becomes something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals another, birds have another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and the star differs from the star in splendor or brightness. So will it, will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. Yep, this body is perishable. It can die. But it is raised imperishable. That's eternal. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. When God breathed into Adam his spirit, he became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. It's a reference to Christ. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man, the image of Christ. Our bodies will be just like his body was when he raised, was raised from the dead. So the, it will be like the body of Jesus after his resurrection. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So, what was Jesus able to do in his resurrected body? Let's take a look at this, because this is what we will be able to do in our resurrected bodies. Appearances, after, uh, uh, appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. First he appeared to Mary Magdalene, then to the 11 disciples. He also appeared to the disciples, which then included Thomas. He also uh, appeared to the seven disciples on the beach and to the disciples at the ascension. These are all appearances of Jesus Christ. And there were many more that weren't recorded. But these are where people saw him in his resurrected body. Well, what did they see? Um, he also appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road. So let's look at some of these. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, Magdalene out of whom he had driven seven demons. Okay, so he appeared to Mary Magdalene first. And then in John, we read about the same event. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. So at first, Mary Magdalene did not recognize Jesus in his resurrected body. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? 
Who is it you're looking for? Now, she was thinking he was the gardener. And she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in the Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. So at that point, she looked at him and recognized him. That means that you guys are going to recognize me in my glorified bodies, and I'm going to recognize you. The same is true in, in Luke 16, where Jesus is teaching about the afterlife. And the uh, a rich man who died recognized Abraham, and he recognized Lazarus. Okay, so we recognize each other after death. He appeared also to the 11 disciples. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating, and he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Notice that he knows the thoughts of their hearts here. He can discern what they're thinking inside. And I think that we will be able to do the same in our resurrected bodies, our glorified bodies. Here he appears to the disciples where Thomas is also included. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, notice this, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He passed into the room even though the doors were locked. And I think that is an indication that in our glorified bodies, we'll be able to think where we want to go and be there in just a split moment. Okay? If I want to go to Paris, I think about it, and that's where I'll, I'll be. I think that's a, a power that we will have on the resurrected, or on the uh, millennial reign of Christ. Okay. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Notice that Jesus' resurrected body still had the wounds. Well, does that mean if, if like, uh, I've only got one leg, does that mean I'll only have one leg in my resurrected body? I'm not sure about that. Uh, I think that Jesus retained his wounds as a testimony to what he had done. Whether or not we will have um, our physical ailments, the, the visible ones, uh, with our resurrected bodies is, is doubtful because we will be in an eternal body and full of joy. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, and it happened this way, and we go on with the story. Simon Peter Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. There are seven of them. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter said, told them, and they said, we'll go with you. Now remember, Simon Peter is the guy who had denied Christ, and at this point in his life, he was probably feeling way down. All right? But so he's going to turn back to what he knows, and that is fishing. We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, and th but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. Now, Jesus is calling. He's talking. They understand what he says. So we will be able to speak to those who are in earthly bodies during the millennial reign. And they'll be able to hear us. Uh, John 21, 6, he said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the, disciples whom, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is our Lord. It is the Lord. So John said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. He was so eager to get to Jesus that he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they'd landed, they saw a fire of burning coals th there with fish on it. 
and some bread. Now this implies that Jesus was eating in his glorified body. And that would make sense because we're going to eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. So this is the account of the seven disciples on the beach. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after the, he was raised from the dead. In Acts 1.6, we see the disciples seeing Jesus just before he ascended. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, that's the last question that these disciples asked Jesus before he ascended, is when is your kingdom going to come? When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, this is the last thing that Jesus said to them. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Do you know that this happened on Mount Olivet? That's exactly the same place where Jesus is going to return. He also appeared to Paul on the Damascus Road in Acts 16, 13 to 18. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. So Paul is telling King Agrippa about his experience on the Damascus Road. We all fell to the ground. Doesn't say anything in here about horses, by the way. But they all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you per persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. So he appeared to Paul. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you've seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. At this point, Jesus is sending Paul to the Gentiles to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Jesus is now in his resurrected bodies. Let's summarize what he was able to do. He was able to pass through locked doors. He was recognized when he chose to be recognized. He ate and he spoke and people heard him. He retained the wounds in his side and his hands so this is what we will be able to do because our bodies are going to be like the body of Christ when we're raised. Now, during the millennial reign, three groups of the people are going to inhabit the earth. The first group are the resurrected church. That's us in our new bodies, our glorified bodies, because we're going to come back with Christ to set up his kingdom on the earth. The second group are going to be the survivors from the tribulation period in their natural bodies. There are going to be some survivors, Christians who have accept, turned to Christ after the rapture and who have hidden in the hills, but they're going to enter into the millennium in their natural bodies because they haven't gone through the death experience. So they will be in their natural bodies. And also, there are going to be people born during the, the millennial reign, and they're going to be kingdom-born naturals in natural human bodies. So those are the three groups that are going to inhabit the earth. So in review, we have 
the first judgment or the first resurrection happening in three phases. That's the first resurrection. Then at the uh, at the second coming, but before the millennial reign, we have. Or, I'm sorry. At the great white throne judgment, we have the second resurrection. Okay, and then we have the new heaven and the new earth. So at the end of the 70th week, at the second coming, Jesus will come as a conqueror, riding on a white horse. He's not going to be riding on a mule or a donkey. He's going to be riding on a white horse, a stallion, symbol of power. Okay, And he's coming in a very militant manner because he's coming to take revenge on those who are still living and who have rejected him. He then turns and destroys the Antichrist and the false prophet and so on. He comes. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay? When he presented himself on Palm Sunday, he was the lamb. But now he is the lion. Jesus' reign over the nation Israel as her... Well, Jesus reigns over the nation Israel as her king, and it will begin in the millennium and continue on into the eternal state. It has no end. We will be there because we will reign with him. We're told that many places in the scripture, and his kingdom will never end. Any questions? Quiet class. Okay, the next class, we're going to talk about the differences between the millennium and the new heaven and new earth. And what will the conditions on the earth be like during those periods of time? What's the difference? Okay, there's a big difference between the two. So that'll be the next class. So would you bow your head with mine, please? Let's go to the Lord. Father God, we just thank you for this time. We ask your blessing on what has been taught. We ask that you would just open eyes and hearts to receive, Lord, the whatever you want the people to receive from this, t this time together. And we ask, God, that you would just continue to give us an ever-increasing hunger to dig into your word, Lord, and to learn of the things that you've told us are going to come to pass. And we praise you and we thank you, Lord, giving you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.